Climate change is a global emergency, with its effect felt ubiquitously as wildfires, flooding, and other natural disasters become more frequent and more intense. The Paris Climate Agreement's goal of keeping global temperature rise below 2 degrees now requires more than reducing greenhouse gases. We must now begin to actively remove greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere, with a particular focus on carbon dioxide as the primary greenhouse gas. Today, I will be explaining and evaluating direct air capture, one of the most common types of carbon removal. As its name implies, direct air capture extracts carbon dioxide directly from atmospheric air and can be done through liquid or solid sorbents. In the liquid system, an industrial fan is used to pass air over a chemical solvent, which reacts with the carbon dioxide in the air to produce a CO2-rich solution, from which calcium carbonate pellets are then precipitated out. In the solid system, carbon dioxide is removed by binding CO2 molecules to solid sorbent filters. The binding may occur through fizzesorption, where intermolecular van der Waals forces are used, or chemisorption, where co covalent bonding is used. After binding, the solid sorbent filters are heated and placed under a vacuum, releasing concentrated carbon dioxide. Captured CO2 can then be repurposed as carbon feedstock in the form of synthetic fuels, pharmaceutical synthetic intermediates, and more. Alternatively, CO2 can undergo carbon sequestration, where it is stored as a liquid in underground geological formations. This method achieves what is called negative emissions, because the carbon dioxide is permanently removed from the atmosphere. It is realistically very difficult to decarbonize industrial processes, as this shift in energy supply translates to serious economic concerns for the affected markets and companies. Though this present situation is far from ideal, carbon removal technologies can offer somewhat of an alternative solution to offset these emissions. One of the biggest advantages of direct air capture specifically is its siting flexibility. Plants can be conveniently located where the CO2 can be directly processed, eliminating the need for extensive infrastructure and long-distance transport. In comparison to other carbon sequestration techniques, direct air capture also has a much smaller land use requirement. Perhaps surprisingly, the viability of the technology can also indirectly contribute to the climate change mitigation effort by bolstering the social element of climate resilience, the ability of socio-ecological systems to constructively deal with climate change. The primary concern surrounding direct air capture is its high energy input requirement due to the large fans, exacerbated by the fact that carbon dioxide in atmospheric air is already very diluted. Expectedly, this high energy requirements also means that it is a very costly process. As of 2021, the cost of the removal of a metric ton of CO2 ranges from $250 to $600, which is around 180 to 450 pounds. In sight of the fact that there were already 3,210 gigatons of CO2 in the atmosphere in 2018, the economic expense of carbon removal technologies would seem to be incredibly significant. Additionally, a moral hazard problem arises from widespread public dissemination of the idea of this technology. They may be seen as an ultimate solution and thus dissipate incentives to pursue aggressive emissions reduction actions, which is a very dangerous view. Lastly, we must bear in mind that there is always the potential for important groundwater and ge geological formations to be polluted by pipeline leaks during the process of carbon sequestration. In the International Energy Agency's report of direct air capture as a carbon removal technique, it is labeled as more efforts needed, a term that is worryingly applicable to wider climate change mitigation efforts. Ultimately, the concerns surrounding direct air capture can only be resolved by, number one, a clear understanding that it is a parallel effort to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and number two, more supportive policies that incentivize deployment of these techniques.